My husband is a, was a volunteer firefighter for 35 years in Cheryl, where we live. He just recently retired, and that's him. He's the middle one. He was chief for a while, and the chief always wears white, so that's, where he, that's him, so that they can tell which one's chief when they're, uh, when they're in a fire situation. He served our community for 35 years, like I've said. Um, to be a firefighter, you have to be physically, mentally, and emotionally prepared to give all. Family members also have to be prepared for this. When the call goes out and the radio goes off, firefighters drop what they're doing, what they're doing, and then they head to the fire station immediately. They just go. Accidents, emergencies, or fires don't care if you're working, sleeping, eating, or spending time with your family. They don't care if it's Christmas Eve or Memorial Day. When the call is received, the committed go. If you're that someone who's experiencing an emergency, you wouldn't want it any other way. The next slide, please. This is a picture that I took at a hog barn fire in January a couple years ago. Um, it was way below zero. It was freezing out. It was dark. Um, and when the call went out, most of the fire department showed up, probably about 30 men and women. This is what they do. No one said they were too cold, they didn't feel like it, they didn't want to go, they had to work the next day. Everybody just went. And I am so in awe of what they do. That, and I was freezing, I don't know why I was out there. Um, <laughs> it's an automatic response. They put their personal feelings, their situations, their wants and needs and comforts aside to help others. This is the heart and mindset of a firefighter. Helping others is always first and foremost on their minds. They are very giving by nature. They have surrendered their agendas, their schedules, their family time, their personal time, and even their lives to serve others. It's the same with our police and servicemen and women. Nobody told them to do this. Nobody forced them to join the fire department. And volunteers in small towns like Cheryl don't get paid any monetary compensation. So why do they do it? I believe that those who serve in this way, who surrender all daily, hear and heed a higher call. It's deep within their hearts, an integral part of who they are. It's a call of servanthood, of living out the gospel of Jesus Christ. As Alex said last week, Jesus calls us to be like him, to love God with all our heart, with all our mind, with all our soul, and to serve others and love others as ourselves. We are to serve one another as he served his apostles and ministered those around him. These are not suggestions that he gave us, but commands. If you're seeking God and trying to love him with all you have, serving and helping others is second nature. Or at least I hope it is, or it will be. If you've been doing it for a while, you don't even think about it or hesitate when God brings you an opportunity to serve. You go, just like a firefighter. I love the illustration in, in today's reading of Matthew. The king acknowledged those who ministered to the poor and the thirsty and the hungry and the downtrodden. And, and they said, Lord, when did we do this? They didn't even realize that they were ministering to the least of these, let alone that they were ministering to God. It was so second nature to them that they, were, that they didn't even think about it. They just did it. Like when Melissa Oftedal um, said last week that she'd been teaching Sunday school for four or five years, she said, I don't even know. And I found out, and I find out today during her message, um, that she also teaches, that she was also a Cub Scout leader, and she does so much, you know, that she just doesn't even know what she all does. This shows that service is such a part of who she is that the details aren't important. I would like to make the case that generosity is not so much a choice for firefighters or people like Melissa, but it's a mindset, a state of being that compels you to give and to serve. Right here today, I see several people whom by their actions, I know that they have that same mindset. Grandview is a very generous church, but we still have growing and surrendering to do. The Holy Spirit gives us a gift to use for the building up of our church for each other. We are acting in obedience when we use those gifts. Next slide, please. According to Paul in 2 Corinthians 9 through 12, part of our reading today, 
This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of God's people, but also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. He goes on to say, because of your service by which you have proved yourselves, men will praise God for their obedience, for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel. Some generosity, some results of generosity are supplying the needs of God's people, overflowing praises to God from the receiver, but also from the giver. I know that I am very grateful and humbled when God um, chooses to use me in any small way to further his kingdom or to minister to um, his people. Another result of our generosity is that others see this kindness and know that it's done not for our own ego, hopefully, but to serve God, to please God. Paul also says in verse 13, and I love this part, um, because of your service to others, you have proven yourselves obedient to the gospel that gives you credibility when sharing the gospel. We're not just, we're, we're not just talking the talk, we're also walking the walk. How do we get our hearts right with God? How do we become more like Jesus? How do we get to the point of servanthood as a, as a daily thing that we don't even think about? First, I believe that, next slide, please. We, re, we need to realize that God is abundance, that we live in God's abundance and not our own. He is more than enough, and he always will be. He can fulfill our every need according to his will, and he does. We should not ever worry about having enough, enough time, enough money, enough energy. Um, God takes care of all of that. He's continuously generous, filling us up continuously, renewing us, and bringing us into deeper relationship with him so that we can be continually gen generous to him through each other. I don't know what I would do if I couldn't start my day with my devotions and prayer. Morning is my time to let God fill me up. And then I can go about my day and feel like I have things to give to other people. Each day I need to go back and get filled up. It's a continuous cycle. His mercies are new each morning. And if, think about this, if you never are filling, if you're never emptying yourself, you can't ever get filled up again. You can't ever get renewed. So it's always a continuous cycle that God continuously fills us as we give to others. Second Corinthians verse 8 says, he is able to make all grace abound to you, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. And this is the old-fashioned, non-technical part of my presentation today. I had to look up this word because it was used twice in verse 8. I thought it's interesting. Why did they use it twice? Why is it so important? Um, abound means, it, I looked it up in Strong's Dictionary. It doesn't mean just to be in or to be like I thought it did. Abound means to be in excess, a fix, to, be, to exceed a fixed number or measure, thick or fat or generous, having more than enough. And I like the last, um, the last definition they gave was bountiful giving. I thought that was awesome. I'll just put it over here. So God abounds in us, and he also is able to fill us up so that we can give to others. Next slide. I do have to confess, however, that I am not always generous. I don't always think about being generous. I took the per perspectives course um, this, this spring and winter, and it was an awesome course. It's a 15-week course um, that gives intense learning about God's mission and his heart for people who are, for his people and people who are not yet his people. This course met Sunday afternoons from one to four and included a lot of homework and reading. This class made such an impact on me. It changed my life and lit a fire under me for mission and for prayer. But you wouldn't know it by the way that I grumbled and complained to my husband about it. I love my Sundays. Um, I love resting. I love watching Hallmark movies all day. 
I love spending time with my family and just catching up on things. I went to this class, but I resented giving up my time and my agenda every week. Inevitably, inevitably though, by the end of each class, I was so glad I went, and by the end of the 15 weeks, God had revealed so much of his heart to me that I was, that I was and still am in awe of, of what he did, and I have a sense of urgency to complete his mission. He finally dealt with me and my bad attitude. I finally got it on the last week. Like, you have learned so much. What are you complaining about? You had this time. So I realized that I needed to repent and surrender my time, my agenda, my whole heart to him, which I did and continue to do because time is, is, is something I really treasure. Um, I, I now have a new perspective on generosity of time. Could you go back two slides, please, Chad? Perspectives class also taught me one more to see. Um, the one about the abundance. Perspectives class also taught me to see all peoples of the earth as God's children, which is how Jesus saw everyone. And this is my second point, that we're all in this together. God doesn't want anyone to perish. He wants us all to be lifted up. He wants us all to know his love. He wants us all to have eternal life. If I'm loving God with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my strength, why wouldn't I want that for him, for us? Why wouldn't I work to make that so? We are all intertwined and, and interdependent. As we have been blessed by the generosity of God and others, we turn and bless others. One of my spiritual gifts is exhortation or encouragement. I've learned to be open to the people God sends me and have had the humbling and awesome experience of walking beside and encouraging others through tough times. And I found that even in tough times, tough times can be a gift as we use the wisdom and courage from our experiences to be present to those who are struggling. We are blessed to be a blessing. When we really start to understand the love God has for us from the very beginning and that he so generously gave his only son, his most precious gift for our salvation, that we can not only be called his sons and daughters, but co-heirs with Jesus Christ. We can only cry out, here I am, Lord, I surrender, use me. I remember what my husband once said to me about being on the fire department. We do it because we care about people and we want to help people. Those who don't, um, those who don't have that mindset, those who do it for any other reason, don't last. As Christians, we give because God loves us, and we want to thank him by helping others. My last slide is T-shirt. I found this shirt at Walmart the other day. I thought it was perfect. God was speaking to me because I did not know what I was going to write, so he kind of helped me out a little bit, started me off. I found this shirt at Walmart the other day. It happened to be um, on a woman. I saw going by, and I chased her down and asked her if I could take a picture of her shirt. <laughs> she was very generous and gracious. She said yes. Well, it turns out I knew this lady. Uh, well, it is Dubuque after all. So, um, She's a wonderful Christian who doesn't just wear the shirt. She lives it. God has called us. No, not, not called. Called seems like it's, eh, whatever. I don't, if I don't have to go, I don't want to. But he has commanded us to live generously. Jesus doesn't apologize for that. He expects it. He gives his grace in abundance, having everything we need to do his good work. I'd like to close my portion of the message with a prayer. Lord, let us surrender our lives to you as firefighters surrender their lives to their communities in times of distress. Make generosity a personal value in us that is lived out daily as a grateful response to what you have given us. Turn our hearts to you, creating a culture of servanthood in our church and among all your people that is as natural to us as breathing. May your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And now for Brett. Thank you.
Good morning. Now, I want to preempt this, that we as the Ad Board got together and came up with today's service. I hope you don't think it's a train wreck, Waylon, but it's... <laughs> But we're here, we're here to give. And the reason I'm kind of going off script a little bit here is because we were prayed upon, we prayed for each other, and we prayed about these messages. So I had no idea what Becky was going to say. She has no idea what I was going to say. So if they're similar, it's, I think it's God wants us to hear what's going to be said. So again, good morning. As mentioned, my name is Brent Culbertson. I'm also on the GrabView ad board. You can go ahead, my first slide. I've been attending here with my family, Melissa, Sam, and Aaron, for about five years now. And I came to Grandview because of somebody's gift. Somebody's gift that they were willing to teach Dave Ramsey financial peace and invited us to Grandview to come to that class. So this leads me to the question, I was brought here because of somebody's gift. What I want you to ponder and to think about, where would Grandview be today without the gifts and generosity from others. You can go ahead and switch, Chad. What gifts do you have to offer? And is there something stopping you from using those gifts? I want to tell you a little bit about my story. But as Becky said, I'm not up here to feed my ego about my story. I just want you to think, hey, if Brent can do it, anybody can do it. Most of my gifts that I give at Grandview or most anywhere is just because I showed up, or I'm just being there. Last fall, I was given blood in this very room, and I was speaking to Hannah about Sunday school because I know they were having difficulty filling some spots. And I asked her this, to be honest, because I was an uh, ad board. I wanted to brainstorm with her on how to, get to fill, how to fill these slots. Well, the recruiter that Hannah is, she's like, hey, would you like to do it? My first reaction was to say no, because at 9.30 in the morning is when I do my cell group. And as a Christian man, it's hard to find other Christian men to speak with God about. So I didn't want to give that up. I know even with people like Aaron LaFoe, I didn't want to give it up. <laughs> I went home that evening and I talked to my wife a little bit about what happened in the conversation. She's like, well, I'm surprised you said no. She said, you seem to fit in really well with the high school kids. I'm sure it's a maturity thing. I can learn, <laughs> I can learn a lot from them. So the next day... Um, I let Hannah know that I would help out with the Sunday school for the high school kids. Unbeknownst to me, this really turned out to be a great experience for me. Yes, it was a need that needed to be filled by the church, also a need for the young adults of this church, but I actually got a lot out of it. I learned a lot about some of the families, and I know they've got some stringent rules on the cookie table, but I was also able to give of myself and some of the experiences that I have had in my life I, not, I'm not, I don't claim to be a perfect Christian, but I also have been through times and tough times and remember what high school was like and be able to share what other people are and what perspectives are after high school. I also got to meet two wonderful men, Dan Splinter and Ethan Waters. These two are very enthusiastic about their love for God, and they were excited to be a part of this high school class as well. The three of us had very different backgrounds. We all are at three different places in our life, but we were able to work together and teach and learn from the high school students. Because I gave up my cell group time, I was able to learn from the students, and I was also to meet more men that had a love for God and more guys that I can count on to talk about Jesus Christ. Another thing I've done here at Grandview is taught financial peace for, with Dave Ramsey. There was a need for a class to be taught in the church, so I reached out if I could help. At this time, I facilitated three Dave Ramsey classes. The reason I do this is because this class was wonderful for Melissa and myself. I was great to be able to share the gifts of knowledge and my experiences and to be able to help people make good decisions with their money. I had to give up a lot of nice Sundays, so I, I understand what you were saying there before. But it's something I really, really thought I wanted to do. But the side effect of helping everybody else, is that it kept us staying on track, and we were able to become debt-free four years later. And I have one last story I'd like to share about me giving of myself. This doesn't have to do anything with service at Grandview, because it was fine. There's many opportunities outside of Grandview for you to give. The situation I'm going to speak about, I hope none of you ever have to go through. One snowy Friday night, 
I found myself picking up shards of glass on the living room floor because Sam broke the bookcase. I sent Sam to his room because at that moment it was not a good, good for me to see him. So because it was glass, I, started, I put on winter gloves so I wouldn't cut my fingers. I put on some waterproof boots that I had sitting around so I wouldn't step on any glass. And when I started picking up that last piece of glass, Sam came running down the stairs, screaming the neighbor's house was on fire. I immediately went running outside, and I saw them frantically taking some of the possessions out of their house. I went over to try and help them get some things out of their house. And when I stepped in their garage door, I could not see my hand in front of my face. So I very sternly told them to get out of their house. Because we live in a rural area, the first truck showed up and threw all, threw all the water on it. And then that was it, and they had to wait for backup. And as I mentioned, it was a snowy night, and we were on the last inch of snow on a seven-inch snowstorm. So it was difficult for any fire departments to get there. All I could do was stand by my neighbors and cover them with blankets while their house burned to the ground. I hated every second of being there. It makes me tear up, sorry, every time I think about it. But I would do it again in a heartbeat. There wasn't anything I could do for them at that time but just be present. I guess my point is with these stories is I didn't think I was really good at anything. I didn't want to give up my time with the men of Grandview to teach the high school class. I was somebody that was in debt trying to teach a debt-free class. And I would never be able to provide the amount of comfort needed in the moment of tragedy. So where can you start? What talents do you have? You can change the slide, Chad. I'm gonna use a little bit something familiar and if, that we can all relate to. Well, at least I hope we can all relate to. The most of you, I hope, have seen The Wizard of Oz. So I do apologize if I spoil this for anybody. <laughs> so Dorothy meets three friends that have an ask on her way to go see the wizard. So she invites them to come with us, to come with her. So she finds her friend, the scarecrow. And what did the scarecrow want? A brain. What did the tin woodsman want? And the cowardly lion? OK, so most of you have seen it. I'm good. But when we get to the end of the movie, the characters come to find out something that we already knew about the three of them. We already knew that Scarecrow had a brain, the Tin Woodsman had a heart, and the Cowardly Lion had the courage. But this is kind of a lot like our lives. Because so we're afraid to see our, we are afraid to see our own talents and gifts. So here is what I, what I suggest. Just show up. We have many events around here that happen. And I'm going to pick on Nikki. She's not here, but if she was, she'd be mad at me for calling her out. But Nikki Simon has planned many things here at Grand Few. And many times I have been there on the day of the event that she's planned. And all I have to do is ask, and she is not afraid to give me a job. She doesn't ask if I'm good at it. She isn't afraid if I mess up. And if I do, I have not been fired yet. This goes with any event planned here at Grand View. Find the person that's in charge. If you have a talent, tell them what your talent is and what you'd like to do to help. If not, just show up and ask for a job. And if you're good at taking direction, it's good to start. It's a good start, and you'll get to know more people. For one instance, I worked for an hour doing dishes at a Valentine's dinner with Christy Dewar. I spent a couple of late nights with the Connolly family in the Brat booth. They're not the most glamorous jobs, but I got to know them a little bit more and shared a few laughs with them. Waylon read to us earlier from Matthew 25, and I want to read it again, and I know Becky said it again, but I think it's important that we all hear it again. Verse 40, the king replied, Truly I tell you, whatever you did to the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you are doing to me. Some very powerful words. How we treat others is how we treat Jesus. If you saw Jesus carrying grocery stores and drop, and the drop them, for sure you'd go, see, go pick them up. But I want to just by a raise of hands here, who has Jesus in their heart today? I want everybody to kind of look around, see all these people that have a love for Jesus. If Jesus is in their heart, that means there's a piece of them. So I'm going to repeat what I asked earlier. Where would Grandview be without the gifts and talents with those who attend? What gifts do you have to offer? Is there anything stopping you from using those gifts? 
And you never know, by using those gifts, you might find that out that you've had a brain, a heart, and the courage all along. I encourage each and every one of you at Grandview to get out and help in Grandview and your community. And maybe it's something that's just giving a smile. And most of the time when you give a smile, you're going to get one back. Giving someone a smile is giving Jesus a smile. I promise that when you step out of your comfort zone and do different things, the risk is worth the reward. I encourage you to share your talents. Just like the Wizard of Oz, you all have had the gift of generosity all along. Please bow your heads and pray with me. Our Father in heaven, thank you for bringing Waylon, Becky, and our band, and all the ad board here to come together to be able to deliver your message today. It's quite obvious that you were speaking through us because our messages have all been so similar. I pray for everybody here that they're not afraid to fail with their talents and just get in out there and do your word as you are asked. And then they get out there and they pray for you and they pray for themselves, and they pray for others. And if you all run out of words to pray, Jesus has always given us words to pray, so please join with me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.